Okay, stretch and hold and hold and hold. What happens when you stretch? What exactly are you stretching? Is it your muscle or is it your connective tissue? Connective tissue, or fascia as it's also known, is what holds us together. It is a net that suspends your organs, a high-tech adhesive that holds your cells in place while relaying messages between them. The network is so extensive and ubiquitous that if you were to lose every organ, muscle, bone, nerve, and blood vessel, your body would still retain its shape. So what happens when you don't stretch? And then when you do stretch, how long should you hold it? These questions led to a decades-long research project into acupuncture and stretch. It started when our guest, Dr. Alain Langevin of the Harvard Medical School, Brigham Women's Hospital questioned why acupuncture needles grab. What are they grasping? And how long should the treatment last? We invited Dr. Langevin to join us for a conversation that matters about stretch. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Dr. Langevin, welcome to Conversations That Matter. Thank you very much. I came across your material in researching a uh, introduction that I have to do for you at an event, the Dr. Rogers Prize in Complementary and Alternative Medicines. We've come a long way when it comes to understanding how our bodies work and respond to treatments that maybe take us outside of the allopathic model. You have focused on the science of stretch. What exactly is the science of stretch? Mm -hmm. Well, we're in the process of finding out, really. I mean, um, stretching is something that we do all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Animals stretch, right? Your dog stretches when it gets up in the morning and yawns and stretches and uh, babies stretch and people stretch, you know, because it, it feels good to stretch. But Yes, it does. <laughs> but beyond feeling good, right? Mm -hmm. what, what happens when we stretch? We know actually not that much about that. Is, is it important to stretch? How much, how often should we do it? How long should we stretch for? And then importantly, do bad things happen when you don't stretch? Ah. If there's a part of your body that you're not moving for some reason, either because it hurts to move mm -hmm. or because you can't move it for some reason, either you're, you're in a splint or something, or you, you, you know, there, there, there are a variety of reasons. Your posture, for example, some people who are uh, ha in a habit of posture find that they cannot move their body out of that posture mm -hmm. because there's been in that posture for so long. So we're really interested in both the, the effects of stretching and the effects of not stretching. When I think of stretching, I've always in my you know, entire life thought, well, I'm stretching my muscles. Mm. But <laughs> you're saying that's not all we're stretching. Right. <laughs> It comes down to this connective tissue. Yeah. Let's first of all define what connective what tissue connective is, tissue what its role in the body is, and then why it's so important that we stretch that connective tissue. Right. Well, muscles, we start from muscles, right? Because muscles are exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We think we're stretching our muscles. Muscles are surrounded by an envelope of connective tissue, not only around the muscle, but also inside the muscle. Every single little muscle fiber has a little mini envelope of connective tissue around it. So the whole muscle is kind of invested in this multi-dimensional tube of mm -hmm. connective tissue. So that's one thing. But the connective tissue doesn't stop there. It goes between each muscle, so it transmits the force from one muscle to the muscle next to it. We used to think that the force that a muscle exerts, exerts goes mm -hmm. pulls on the tendon, yeah. right, and that pulls on the bone. Well, that's actually not the case. Uh, there's some really elegant recent research that's shown that a large component of the force that a muscle exerts goes laterally to the connective tissue around it and then to the muscles next door. It's distributed throughout the, the limb, very interestingly. And then the connective tissue, wow doesn't just stop at the musculoskeletal system, which is yeah. what I've just described. That's the musculoskeletal type you know, component. Right. Of, it surrounds every single other part of the body, including veins, arteries, nerves, lymphatic vessels. Then it goes inside of organs, your heart, your liver, your lungs, your kidneys. Every single organ of your body has what we call a matrix of connective tissue. It's the scaffold. It's what makes the shape of the, whatever body part you're looking at. And it's a common 
denominator through the entire body. I mean, I find that's mind-blowing. You know, it's, it's really there everywhere. Uh, well, it's, as you're describing this, I'm thinking it's, it's been invisible to me because I've never heard anybody describe this mm. as being, uh, I want to say like a force field, but it's not entirely, but it's, it is that yeah. connective tissue. When I was doing some research about you, I was thinking, gee, uh, the knee bone really is connected to the hip mm -hmm. bone mm -hmm. um, and connected. to everything. Yeah, <laughs> like to everything. Yeah, a and that's it. That's so, it. <laughs> so what happens without the connective tissue? Well, the body would not be held together. I mean, it would just be these kind of disconnected organs and things that wouldn't possibly work together. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing that's intriguing to me is why have we not seen it so so far? Why? Well, yeah, well, that's a really good question. School, yeah. right? You dissect your the cadaver in medical school, you cut the connective tissue to get to the important things that you're supposed to be looking at, the, the veins, the arteries, the whatever. The connective tissue literally was ignored. It was this kind of gray stuff that... that you just you know, got out of the you way. You just cut through it. And sadly, that's also what happens during surgery. Yes. So this connective tissue is literally cut to get to the organs. and. I, I have to say that's mm -hmm. changing. A lot of surgeons now are paying attention mm -hmm. to what they call fascia, which are the sort of layers of connective tissue, trying not to disrupt them too much because mm -hmm. they realize this is a new understanding now in surgery that the, the fascial planes, the integrity of the fascial planes is important mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the recovery. Process. You know, as you're talking about this, I, I have gone in and uh, videotaped open heart surgery mm. and was completely unaware of the fact that there was this other mm. layer, this connective tissue. I watched them open the skin, cut the sternum, pull the rib cage yeah. back, and but I'm thinking, do I recall seeing this at all? It, it was as though it yeah, was. Yeah, it's hard to see. Yeah. It's hard to see because it's sort of just this sort of a little bit amorphous, but when you start paying attention to it, you start seeing the layers. Mm -hmm. And the layers are organized. They're not, they're not just uh, kind of three-dimensional mesh. No, no. there are organization to it. There's, a, there's a, a polarity to it, a directionality to the fibers, even though they're kind of woven, but there, there are different specific angles that these connective tissue planes take, mm -hmm. and, and then they crisscross. It's very interesting. It create these uh, planes where you can stretch in one direction or another, either against mm -hmm. the direction of the fibers or towards them. It's, this, this whole science of this begin, beginning to to emerge to understand that. So you had your introduction to the connective tissue when, as I understand it, you had patients asking whether or not acupuncture might mm -hmm. be, uh, uh, you know, a an alternative therapy for chronic pain. Yeah. And uh, and rather than say I don't know anything about acupuncture, stay away from it. You decided to go. <laughs> to study acupuncture. Uh, I was curious. I mean, I... I <laughs> but it's not how great discoveries are made. <laughs> well, I think curiosity is really is, is the number one ingredient, right, yeah. in science. Yes. You, you, just, you just wonder. And so that's what happened. Uh, I, and then uh, I took a part-time class just in the evening. There was uh -huh. a school of acupuncture that was very close to where I was practicing. And uh, I took a couple of classes, and then they would say, well, you have to insert the needle, and then you have to twist the needle. This, and I kept finding that the needle was, I was feeling something that was happening as I was rotating the needle. And uh, I would ask, well, what's, what's this cause? It feels that the tissue was grabbing mm -hmm. the needle, and, I, and manipulating it became more difficult over time. More, more, there was more resistance. And so I was probably like a muscle contracting. Yeah. But there, there are places you could insert the needle, like right here at the wrist. There's no muscle at all. And you could still feel that. You'd still get this needle yeah. grab. Yeah. So that felt like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand it. I didn't understand what I was feeling. And you know, you go back and you think, how many physiological phenomenon are there that you can see and that you can feel with your own hands mm -hmm. and that we don't know what they are? I mean, most of these sort of gross physiological things were discovered 100 years ago, Yeah. right? But this, this was something bizarre. And, um, and so we fairly, well, first, let's first see if we can measure it. Yeah. So that's when we started getting the grant, you know, to measure exactly what this force is that we were feeling with our hands. Mm -hmm. And then that's what led to the rest of the research. <laughs> <laughs> but where did that research take you and what have we learned from it? Well, mm -hmm. uh, right now, 
we, we first started wondering what happens exactly when you twist the needle. Yeah. We've, is there, we, there was an increase in force. We could record that. Then we said, well, what's causing this increase in force? We did some experiments that showed that it was actually the connective tissue that's kind of winding around the needle like, like, like spaghetti around a fork. It's in like twisting and then gradually the needle, the, 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 coll the collagen was kind of getting caught, stuck. Mm -hmm. And then when you would start to move the needle up and down, the, you were essentially pulling on the tissue using the needles. Like you so it wasn't gradually, it, it responds instantly to the intrusion. Yes. Yeah. Right now, the first phenomenon is purely biomechanical. There's nothing magical about it. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of, of uh, winding like things around a winch. And then mm -hmm. the, high, the more you tighten, the, 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 for, the higher the force. Once you've done that, that's just the first piece. Then the acupuncturist starts to do the magic, like kind of the, the art, where they pull, they push, they twist, they turn, they lift, and then they're gradually pulling on the tissues and mm -hmm. they feel with their hands. It's very, very, I mean, technique specific. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to sort of wiggle the tissue around. We, we think of needles as being like little micro manipulators. Yes. You're, you're essentially applying a very targeted, precise force very small but very precise to a small piece of tissue. But what we found in the lab is that the, the connective tissue around the needle responds. The, the so cells. it's not just in that one micro spot? No, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it spreads. So you uh, out over this, what sort of distance? Well, a big distance. Mm -hmm. We've done these experiments in a mouse and a rat, mm -hmm. and what we see is that the response of the cells goes s several centimeters. Like in a mouse, it's all the way around the mouse. From one needle. From one needle. The whole abdomen and back of the yeah. mouth from one needle. Now, in a human, of course, you the same mass. distance, yeah. Yeah. Does, it doesn't, I and mean, we don't know yeah. in humans because we haven't done this. We haven't been able to, to look at the cells in the humans because you would need to take a biopsy and, you know, that's too invasive. We don't want to do that. Right. But so you'd have to be looking at the whole body at yeah. the, the time of the treatment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But in an animal, it's interesting to see that this response is not purely localized to the needle. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's, you know, it, it, there's a more than local effect. I mean, it's, it's quite, a, 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 it spreads. And so we got interested in that. Then that got us interested in connective tissue. Then we thought, well, okay, could you get the same response by simply stretching the tissue? Because do you really, you know, if the, t if the needle is twisting and then the tissue is pulling towards the needle, that should be the same thing as it's a stretch. stretching. It's a yeah. stretch. So we did that. We took a piece of tissue, we stretched it, and we found exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So then we saw, well, it's easier to stretch than to use the needle. So in the, in the lab right now, we mostly use stretching as opposed to acupuncture. But how do you get, well, one of the things that I like about acupuncture is it's reasonably elegant. You've got a small mm. needle that's inserted and, yeah. and you get the stretch. How do you reach <laughs> in and grab the connective tissue? Good question. <laughs> we do it two ways. One way is we actually take the piece of, the same piece of tissue that we would have done the acupuncture on, take it out of the animal, put it in a bath. You can keep it alive. Connective tissue, the nice thing about it, extremely tough. It can stay alive in a bath given the right conditions, you know, a, a bath, liquid, and everything mm -hmm. for hours and hours. So it's very happy. So we keep it there, then we put it in between two grips and we just stretch it. So it's very simple. We just mm -hmm. stretch it and we can control the rate of stretch, the, the, the amplitude, you know, how far it stretches, how long it stretches, very controlled, very reproducible, mm -hmm. and then we can see what happens. We can also stretch the whole animal. So we've developed several different methods of stretching, some when the animal is asleep, mm -hmm. and then we can actually stretch a piece very, you know, passively. Yeah. But then we have another cool method, which is our preferred method, where we do what we call um, rat yoga or mouse yoga, <laughs> where <laughs> we hold the animal very gently by the tail, we, and then we allow the animal to grab onto something with their front feet, either the bar or the cage or the edge of the, And then they t do this amazing thing, which they, they stretch their whole body they push their back feet, they do this spontaneously. They push their back feet back and they hold and they hold this pose and they're stretching. And they can hold this pose for several minutes. They don't complain, they don't, they don't vocalize, they don't indicate that they mm -hmm. are stretching. In fact, they, they get into it, you know, right. and then they relax and then you can encourage them. You know, sometimes we pet them a little bit and then they stretch. And what we find is this has a very profound effect on inflammation. It decreases inflammation when you do that. Uh, huh. in and inflammation in is a big problem. Big problem, yes, yes. And so inflammation is related to so many things. Mm -hmm. It's related to chronic musculoskeletal pain, it's related to many different types of uh, inflammatory diseases, 
It's even related to cancer. Bowels, heart, yeah. Inflammation is across the board. It's one of those sort of systemic uh, problems that people, it goes across all systems. Mm -hmm. So understanding how stretching can impact inflammation is is important, I think, you know. So that's where we are, that's our kind of edge right now that we're looking at. So in doing this research, have you then basically kind of figured out why acupuncture works? Works for what? That's well, the thing, though, right? right. It, mm-hmm. Acupuncture is used for so many different things. Some people use it as an analgesic, right? That's how the original studies where they said people were even having anesthesia or they would do it for a toothache. Mm-hmm. So you have a temporary pain, like you've just had a tooth extracted, and somebody will do acupuncture. They'll put a needle on your hand here or something, mm-hmm. and then they'll put strong stimulation to it, either strong manipulation or electrical current or something that right. really so sort of overrides the pain. That's yeah. just analgesia. That's very simple, well known, well understood. It's it's not specific to acupuncture. Mm-hmm. It's called neural stimulation analgesia. You can do it a variety of different ways. You could do it by just rubbing your shin really hard. You know, it's it's oh, okay. a, yeah, it's a yeah. it's a it's a it's a um, a competing sensory input mm-hmm. that has to be strong. It has to be almost noxious. Yeah, but it 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 kills the more noxious yeah. pain. But there's, there's uh, many other ways to think about acup- acupuncture. is often done not to do temporary analgesia, but to help the tissues heal. To, if somebody has, for example, osteoarthritis of the knee or some kind of problem, that back pain or neck pain or something, they'll go to the acupuncturist. The acupuncturist is not trying to sort of deaden your pain right now. They're trying to make your neck better. Mm-hmm. They're trying to help the neck or the back uh, rec- recover mm-hmm. from what happened to it to cause the pain. Yeah. So they will address things that are more complex. Mm-hmm. They will start looking at what they call trigger points or tender points. They'll look for places where the connective tissue or the muscles have become sort of, you know, knotted or abnormal to palpation, and then yeah. they'll put needles in there. Yeah. And there's more or less understood what the needles are doing, but there's a, an effort to he- heal. Mm-hmm. the process. And then of course people do acupuncture for all kinds of other things, you know, allergies, right. asthma, whatever. You know, there's there's many different applications to acupuncture which we understand, some of them understand almost nothing, you mm-hmm. know, scientifically, and some we understand more. Huh. I've also heard about these energy meridians mm-hmm. or uh, chi. Yes. Um, where does this come into play with the connective tissue, or is we starting to move into an area that you're not there at yet? I find the, I find the concept fascinating. I don't know how to ask a research question around that. We don't have the tools to understand what chi is. I mm-hmm. mean, it's a metaphysical almost sort of concept, very sort of philosophical. It underlies a lot of traditional Chinese medicine thinking. Mm-hmm. And so for that reason, I think it needs to be honored and, and respected. But it's, I, think, I think right now we're not at the level where we can address that. Acupuncture meridians are a different thing, however. Mm-hmm. So very controversial, but, um, and we, I don't claim to know what a meridian is. But what we did observe is that there's a lot of these meridians. When you look at the traditional description in that book, and they'll say, in the groove between this muscle and that muscle, or in the depression between the bone and the muscle, and that's where you'll find the point or the meridian. Well, that's where connective tissue is, right? right? It's where that in between. And we were doing ultrasound studies of people of you know during some of our early early um, forcing you know mechanical mm-hmm. uh, studies in humans, and we were looking at some of these places where acupuncture boards were, and we were seeing these little kind of V-shaped things, and we were thinking, what's that? Well, that was obviously the connective tissue plane mm-hmm. between the two muscles. So. It's just an observation. Yes. It's, it's possible that somewhere along the line, there was an effort to draw a map to insert, to, 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 uh. to, to show people where to put the needle to get into this nice, juicy connective tissue where also nerves and blood vessels are. So it's not really a mystery, I think, that mm-hmm. these are areas that were particularly good targets for something. Yeah. So that's, I think, where, I think these meridians, you know. Right. We, so, and where are we at in uh, our relationship between uh, complementary and alternative therapies such as this and, and uh, the most clinicians who have not 
uh, been been taught these uh, modes or or given these options. Is there? Are you seeing there's a, a growing openness to this? Oh yes. Yeah. No question. When I was started, um, there was really very much not just skepticism, but actually antagonism to towards this. you. Towards me, <laughs> towards towards what I was trying to do, towards um, the field in general of mm -hmm. alternative medicine. A lot of people would say, "Oh, that's just garbage," you know, and don't go there, don't do this. I heard a lot of people warning me. Mm -hmm. um, now there is a more sometimes grudging, but um, sort of openness to at least consider. Mm -hmm. But I would say all the way to enthusiastic acceptance. I mm -hmm. mean, at Harvard Medical School, where I am right now, we have. 12 centers for integrative medicine, 12. 12. 12. At Harvard Medical yes. School. <laughs> wow. And so it's quite remarkable. And at the Osher Center, one, 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 of, one of our jobs is to, is to uh, connect all these people and, get, and, 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 and sort of help them mm -hmm. coordinate, work together. And so we, we sort of, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how much, I mean, in Boston, is there's so much of this all over the place, and it, it, and it has been going on for so long. Uh, uh, institute, for example, the Benson Henry Institute that's been here, you know, or, I mean, this is worth mentioning that Dr. Herb Benson, who started uh, studying meditating monks in the 1970s, mm -hmm. he was curious. He was, you know, he was curious. <laughs> How do they can through this the meditation control? He's a cardiologist. He was, yeah. a, you know. How do they control their blood pressure? They could reduce their blood pressure. They can do all kinds of sort of cardiovascular tricks that he couldn't understand, so he started studying them. Now, the relaxation response is understood physiologically. It's not a mystery. It, mm. it happens, it's, it's a, it's a, it affects the sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic nervous system. And so it's no longer fringe or alternative, but because, that's because this, this has been such a while, such mm -hmm. a long time to get there. So it, it's happening. It's really happening. So, yeah. so I want to come back to the, the, the sort of the issue of chronic pain, which yeah. kind of led you into this. From what you've learned now, what does this bring to people who are uh, challenged with chronic pain? Uh, how can they benefit from this as an alternative form of therapy or one that's complementary to uh, any other sort of treatment they might be receiving? Yeah. Well, very important question indeed, because uh, especially right now, where we have this enormous problem with not just pain, but also of the pain treatment mm -hmm. that leads to a lot of times, a lot of side effects, including opioid opioids, yes. Yeah. And also, I would say non-opioids, the non-steroidal yeah. anti-inflammatories are not totally benign drugs. Right. They do have side effects, not as serious as those of opioids, not as addictive, but so there's a whole sort of pharmacological problem Mm -hmm. I think to our to our uh, current Approach, management, yeah. we are yeah. trying to in, in, in integrative medicine. I think as a whole is trying to really focus on non pharmacological solutions or adjuncts or alternatives or complementary treatments. You know, there's, there's a whole spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to say medicines are bad or drugs are bad, but let's see if there's going to be other options for people, especially. At, well, at all stages of their their journey, mm -hmm. before they get, you know, maybe preventive, maybe once somebody starts to get pain, to try to prevent them having to take strong medicines. But then, if they are addicted, try to help them st reduce mm -hmm. and stop altogether, and then prevent the pain from coming back. To me, that the whole thing, I think that these non-pharmacological, including mind-body therapies like meditation, relaxation techniques, extremely important for mm -hmm. people when they're in the throes of, of having pain. Just knowing how to relax can be a huge help. Mm -hmm. Then movement, moving. People who spend all day at a desk sitting down and have back pain, well, Sometimes just moving around, learning what is the kind of movement that I can do safely that's not going to aggravate my pain. Because a lot of times, yeah. people who are in pain, they're afraid to move because they don't want, they don't want to bend over because it's going to hurt. So mm -hmm. They don't bend. They have to learn how to move safely and then gradually increase their movement. So, and then of course, other things like manual therapies, massage, um, acupuncture, all of these things. There's a big variety of options that can help. We mm -hmm. just have to learn how to integrate them. 
I, I embrace the change. <laughs> and, and I'm happy that there are people like you who, when you are presented with a, a challenge, go, hmm, okay, let me learn. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> and because you're helping to change the, the, the range of options that we as mm. individuals uh, can employ. We can all benefit. I, mean, I benefit, you benefit. I mean, I think that's the nice thing is there's yeah. not a, a, a doctor or a nurse or who doesn't at some point need help with things kinds of, it's universal. Everybody yeah. gets pain somewhere, you know, uh, and mm -hmm. so I think, I think gradually and the new generation, I think, of doctors who grow up with this, either in their homes or they see it around, I think there's this, this just gradual more openness and, and, and curiosity, I guess. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for coming in and doing this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's much my pleasure.